Hey, we're Drew and Kitty Taylor, and this week on The Catholic Link Show, we got to interview Rachel Bullman about her new book that she edited for Word on Fire called With All Her Mind. It dives into the intellectual life, into spirituality lived out in congruence with our mind and our heart, and I... Oh, loved this book, the prayer that it drove in my own life. And this conversation was so much fun and yet inspiring and deep. And so we pray that it blesses you uh, and your intellectual life. Hey, Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so good to be with you guys. Uh, for all of our listeners here at Catholic Link, we're really excited to have Rachel Bullman here on the show uh, to talk about her new book that she edited. So for those of you guys who don't know, Rachel is uh, a wife, a mother of six children, and just in her spare time, she happens to <laughs> edit books, do a TV show called Meet the Bullmans, um, works with the Word on Fire Institute. The She's in a given institute, um, yeah, like, all of it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so definitely an underachiever that we're excited to talk to. Right. <laughs> It's going to be very boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. right. She has nothing to really add to the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but since you tuned in, let's, <laughs> let's dive in. So, um, oh man, Rachel. Okay. So Rachel, you put together this book um, with all her mind, A Call to the Intellectual Life. And uh, you got, how many is it? I can't, math in public, 20 authors? It's a, it's, I think there's 16 authors okay. and there's 17 essays all together. Yeah. Yes. Um, of, of powerhouse women to get together to talk about uh, just the, the beauty of femininity and the intellectual life. So, so my question is what on God's green earth inspired you to be <laughs> editing this book while you're having twins and raising a family and sure. trying to do all that? Yeah. What, just, what, <laughs> what was what, the inspiration? Yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny because right whenever we found out that we were having twins, I I was completely shocked, of course, because when they told me that there were two, I was I was very alarmed. I didn't know what he meant by two, what he was referring to. <laughs> and so I remember after after telling my husband and we had both kind of shared in that shock, we were kind of looking, I was kind of looking at my life, like brushing my teeth one night. And I was like, wow, you know, Lord, I really feel called to do the things that you're calling me to do. Like, I know that I feel called to speak and to write and to help with these ministries that I've been helping with. Why would you give me twins right now? <laughs> like, this is great, but wow, we should have talked. Like we could have like lined up our calendars or something, but almost immediately the Lord was like, Rachel, you always tell everyone that you are a wife and a mother. Mm -hmm. And those things still exist. And you're still going to be doing all of these things, even when you keep saying yes to the other things that I'm calling you to. And so it was like there was an expansion of even my own understanding of who I am as a woman. And, and I think that's where this book really came from, too, is just being able to expand what the understanding is and the call that we have to answer as women. And I think, you know, since John Paul II with his you know, letter to women and him using that, that phrase, the feminine genius and the genius of women, that everybody has something to say about that. You know, what is the feminine genius? And, and so when I, when I go to read these books, they're great and beautiful, but no one was really talking about the intellectual life mm -hmm. or the life of the mind. And so I had read uh, Serge Lange's book, The Intellectual Life. And, and some in, in those, in that book, which it was written, you know, in a time when you're not talking about the intellectual life of women. He actually uses a woman, Beatrice, in there as an example in the intellectual life. But he often says that like Beatrice is is shopping or she is, if she's like there to listen when when her husband who is studying needs to needs to then, you know, vent about his day or how difficult his studying is. And I remember thinking, wow, we really need to update this book <laughs> like we need we need a new a new conversation about the intellectual life and so when those two things came together and then the invitation to do it with Word on Fire it really kind of all aligned and that's where the book came from even amidst all the chaos it made it even more beautiful oh uh, I think that that's such a beautiful testimony of our ability to expand and grow and just for you to take this on. And when we are doing where the Lord has called us, it makes mm. it easy and fruitful. 
often I think that we take on a lot of things that are not what the Lord has called us to, and then we feel overwhelmed and burdened right. and drugged down because it's like, I've said yes to 50 things. Did I pray about a single one of them? No, I'm right. overwhelmed and I'm dying. <laughs> um, and so I, I think this reality that in His grace, we're expanded in that capacity. And I really think that this book expanded my understanding in a huge way of what the intellectual life was. The first Mm. three chapters kind of hit me first off of the first three essays of just this reality of I, growing up, uh, the intellectual life was, the intellect was the ultimate good. Mm. And so there was this lie that, that didn't really connect with faith. And Mm. that faith was okay for lesser minds who needed comfort. And so really that faith was a place of comfort and pacifier and Band-Aid and the intellectual life was like the goal. And right in the beginning, I mean, Sister Josephine just hits so strongly on how our faith elevates our intellect, that God isn't just like the sub part that like, uh, these or these two can go together or like they kind of complement each other. No, like the intellectual life is, our intellect is elevated through a life of prayer, through yes. growing in virtue, through all of these different components. And I, I was curious as you read through these essays, as you worked on this project, how your perceived uh, previous notions about the intellectual life had changed uh, through this project? Well, what was really amazing was that, uh, you know, the Word on Fire team, the publishing team had told me, they said, Rachel, you just got to think of like, who who would you really want to write about the intellectual life if we we were going to put together this book of essays? And uh, I remember laughing and thinking, well, I mean, I'm just going to write all the people that have inspired me, you know, a lot that I've never met and many that I, I have had the pleasure of being able to just share mm-hmm. a cup of coffee with or something. And so, and then I thought the things that these women have inspired me about, maybe I can just ask them if they could write about that particular thing. Mm-hmm. Because it's one thing when you write someone and you say, hey, can you write an essay? But it's a lot better if you can say, kind of would like it to be about this thing if possible. <laughs> and so everyone was like, yes, I can, I can do that. Yeah. And if you read the book, it's kind of like we all sat in a room and all wrote it together because of how well it all fit together. It was, mm-hmm. I mean, the Holy Spirit just did some amazing work mm-hmm. putting all of it in, in this book. Um, but for me, I think every single one really kind of showed me a different facet of the intellectual life. Because I really like the phrase that like we understand the intellectual life. There's so many, so many layers to it, as many as there are women in the world. Mm -hmm. And so if we're trying to understand the intellectual life, according to the feminine mind, then you're going to see it. And every, every woman you meet, you're going to understand something different about it. I was at a a grand opening of a park here in our hometown this weekend, and they had a, a muralist there. And so when you come into the park, she's just sitting there painting these incredible pictures. And I remember my kids just stopping and they were like, you did that? And she's like, she literally has a paintbrush in her hand. And she's like, I did. (laughs) But but even that, even something as simple as as painting, and, and that's not simple, by the way, that's very hard. But watching someone paint, that's an exercise of the intellectual life because they're bringing something that is outside of themselves, that's ambiguous, that some people cannot touch, and they're making it perceivable. And, mm-hmm. and that's what all of these women did. And I think that that was the biggest no, that was the biggest thing for me it was just an expansion, like you had mentioned, about saying, well, this is what I always thought the intellectual life was. I thought it always belonged in the walls of the university. I thought it, we only talked about it when we talked about Aquinas. And now it's it's something that we can talk about because all of these women have presented it in these multifaceted ways and that it's something for all of us. Mm. Uh, Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And something that stood out when I read the book, um, because we can, we can think of the intellectual life as just like the bookworm, right? Like someone, Oh, someone who's super smart. um, And that's not me. So what would you say to someone who, who thinks, Oh, well, I'm, I'm not an intellectual. I I didn't get good grades. um, So maybe this book isn't for me. 
So I would tell them that even just making that assumption is an exercise in the intellectual life. For you to just make an assumption about what you can and cannot know is to say that you've exercised intellectual life. So you should find something that inspires that kind of deep thought because you can have deep thoughts about the birds that you see flying in your backyard. You can have deep thoughts about the Summa Theologia. You can sit down and have deep thoughts about Grey's Anatomy. You can sit down and have deep thoughts that inspire you to, to what the human heart really longs for, which is worship. And so we begin in this place of the intellect so that we can dive deeper and understand our spiritual life and dive deeper into the depths of our heart. And so everything has to be linked together. And for a person to say that the intellectual life is not for them would really also be them saying that they weren't a person because it's really for every single person in some way. They have to find it. I think that actually stands out to me even in the very last essay by Trish is she just talks about being in motherhood, in postpartum depression, pregnant with her second, going, you know, I and her therapist said to her, find a hobby. She was like, I can't find a hobby. Like, what do you need a hobby? And her husband's like, how about writing? And she's like, can writing be a hobby? Like, I thought I had to kayak or I had to do this or I had to, you know. And so often we can do the same thing with the intellect. We can say, well, I'm in the thick of this phase of life. I have a really demanding job that requires my intellect. So I can't think about other cool things or right. I have all these tiny humans and they have crushed my intellect. <laughs> and so <laughs> therefore I am incapable of stepping into this. And just that realization that we are each called to find something that we are passionate mm -hmm. to think about that that um, – so many of the authors, yes, it did seem like you guys worked on this together to weave this theme in, in there is the idea that we are called to create and mm -hmm. to bring that outside of ourselves. And that is what the intellect does is it goes into this creation. And so whether we are creating new life, whether we're creating essays, whether we are just bringing forth the book words into our mind, I, all of it is just such a beautiful gift. I I was so inspired as I read this book. Oh, thank I, God. <laughs> oh it felt so prayerful. It truly felt like the Lord sat down with me after every one of these chapters, I felt called to enter into prayer. And even throughout it, to really reflect on where the Lord was speaking to me. And I am curious as you editing it is a slightly different experience, less prayerful, <laughs> less receiving. Uh, <laughs> as you read this, I, were there contributions that inspired your growth in the intellectual sure. life? Sure. So, you know, I grew up Protestant, so there wasn't a whole lot not to knock my Protestant brothers and sisters, but within my denomination and growing up, there wasn't a whole lot of intellectual stimulation. I was usually reading just whatever spiritual book might come across the, the shelf, maybe sprinkled with a little bit of theology, but I didn't really know the tenets of, of the denominations that I was involved in, in in the Protestant church. But then when I became Catholic and actually probably over the last five or six years and really started to kind of discover philosophy and dive deeper into theology, reading more dense topics and more dense writers. I remember thinking to myself, gosh, what a dream it would be to contribute in some way to academia mm -hmm. and, and just having this, this desire to do that. But also knowing that I don't have any letters after my name and <laughs> I don't have the time to go out and pursue a PhD or to get my master's. And so I was sitting there with that thought and I was also working on the essays for this book, but also working on my next book, which comes out in the spring of this, of next year. And so I was sitting there trying to write and it felt like dying because I, we had just had the baby. So I'm like, I'd read a page and like fall asleep or like try to write. And I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. So those aren't even words. <laughs> And so it was just really difficult. And so finally I sat down and I, with Holly Ordway's essay and, and her essay is really on, on academia. And one of the things that she, she just basically plainly says, this is what it looks like in academia for a woman to do what she wants to do. You just have to do the work. Like it might be harder, 
but you have to do the work. You can't just expect it to fall out of the sky or to, to just make of itself. You have to use your talents to then do that work. And I remember thinking, well, that was a really mean, <laughs> gentle reality check. And I immediately emailed her and I said, I'm planning to just call you when I need you to just give me a swift kick in the butt. (laughs) And then it gave me a lot of courage too, because the things that Holly's doing in the world for us to know how to evangelize through, through thought and to evangelize with our imagination, the things that she's able to bring between theology and philosophy and Tolkien art have been just unbelievable for the world. And so she is definitely a powerhouse for me. And then when I hit a writing slump, which that was a lot of after after the twins were born, there were a lot of writing slumps. I would read Tish's essay and realize that if I I need to just do it when I don't feel like it, <laughs> and it'll be fine. <laughs> so I, I think this is a really good point. I'd, I'd love to just uh, kind of hover here a little bit and, and see what comes out in the so writing books, I, um, you know, it's something that, that Katie and I have, have prayed a lot and about, and it's like, oh, you know, I feel like in some way we, we have been called to write. We're like, what, what do we even write about? Um, and, and it can be discouraging sometimes when you read the greats, um, whether that's, you know, um, in English literature or uh, in the faith, right? I mean, there's so many, I, you just read Thomas Aquinas and you're like, I don't... Uh, but, Why and, did and anyone he, write anything after him? Yeah. Right, no, and, and that, that's what I'm saying, right? And even he, at the exactly. end of his life, was like, everything I've written is straw. And I'm like, I don't know what's below straw, but that's, that's where my me. book would be. <laughs> and so, so I don't know, talk, talk a little bit about that. Like, what, um, yeah, how, uh, what are writers today supposed to, to, to think, or how do you encourage them? Uh, the boldness yeah, the, exactly. The confidence. Yeah. Yeah, so... You're going to make me cry. Uh, <laughs> but the, my first thought is that the Lord is always pursuing us and he pursues us so hard and so strongly that it's often something that you're not going to be able to shake. And so it's going to be this thing that that forms the way that you love your children, the way that you love your spouse, the way that you receive the love from God. And because of the uniqueness of the human person. He's also going to give you this particular call to say it to the world in this particular time. And first thing first, how dare us think that that call and this thing that is pulling on our heart is not great enough to share with the world, that the Lord would would love you so much that he would give this to you. Like how dare us think that we should not share it. (laughs) I can say that because I've had that old argument with myself. Well, this is dumb. Don't tell anyone. And then I'm like, <laughs> the Lord told you. Why, why can't you tell some other people? Um, and so then I would just look for, you know, not 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 look for signs. You know, those people, we don't, we don't do that, right? But I would pay attention to the Lord giving you his confirmation and giving you his consolation. Because there were thoughts this in this next book that's coming out, and even with this book, that that there was this constant like unfolding of this idea in my own life, and I could not shake it. It was like mm-hmm. being stalked, you know, <laughs> being stalked by the intellectual life. And the next book is going to be about uh, becoming wife, and so this mm-hmm. thought of being being stalked by spousality and someone writing about it in a theological and philosophical way, and so. It was just something that I couldn't shake. And when I would talk about it, there was so much joy that came from this place. It was like life coming through my words, life coming out of my own heart, vocally and also as I'm writing it. And and I think when those things happen, then what greater way for you to trust the Lord than to then give it out into the world? Oh. Man, it's deep. It's like- <laughs> It's like, a, it's like she took a spiritual knife out and just threw it across the internet. <laughs> true, oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you for those words of encouragement. Uh, and just the reminder and the challenge of the Lord. The Lord loves us and has mission and plan for every one of us, not just Drew and I, but everyone mm-hmm. listening to this, everyone who gets to read this book. I I laugh at the I'll turn it a little lighter, but the second chapter, it uh, the second essay um, dives into this reality, and so it's Susan Sensor, and I it's like virtue, yeah, and 
I will not lie. I sat down and she's like, re- I'm reading this. And <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, sometimes you think to grow in the intellectual life, I have to like have the perfect quiet space and the hot cup of tea. And as I'm like sipping my hot <laughs> cup of tea, and I'm like, hmm. She's like, and all of a sudden the 40 minutes I had to read turned into like 15 minutes to read. And I was like, yep, yep, yeah, yeah. That's so me in this moment. I was like, could That's you have true. written this? I, I, every every essay I did not read with a cup of tea, but this one, I have that cup of tea. And so just this reality that sometimes I think we do have to have everything aligned. And when we have everything aligned, then X will happen. And mm. I I don't remember which essay, but it was just this idea that like you gotta sit your bottom in the chair and you've got to write and like you <laughs> right. gotta do it. And like when when you do it, that's how it's gonna happen. And I just I think sometimes in life, even in the spiritual life, we go, Lord, I have to have everything put together and then I'll come to you. Mm-hmm. Right. I have to have everything prepared and then I'll come. But how that blocks us from the grace that he wants to give us in our brokenness and how we look at that in our intellectual life. Yeah, it is. It's such a flawed human temptation to mm-hmm. yeah, have everything perfect and then. It's true. <laughs> but, um, the- we definitely imagine everything as a destination. Like, oh, well, this is – that's stop A, right? And then we're going to go over here to stop B <laughs> instead of everything always being on your way mm-hmm. to eternity. So, so good. Yes. So true. <laughs> I, I think one, another thing that stood out to me as I was reading the book was, was how deep it was. Um, and I don't know if it's like the preponderance of, of just faith books today that are, are written kind of, kind of more at a, a basic or introductory level, sure. or maybe that's just the ones we review on, on this show. So, <laughs> so we just, you know, read, read a decent amount of those, which again are, are good and we need those. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. yeah, right. It's like, you know, if someone's coming to the faith or, or they're rediscovering the faith, we need that book to be able to give to them and say like, uh, you know, just, just to, to win their hearts over. Uh, but I feel like with this one, it, it was very relatable and the stories are awesome and they're funny, but it also goes deep, like deep into the life. Mm-hmm. I don't, when, when you were writing the, you know, the authors of the essay where you're like, you know, like, don't be afraid to be funny, but also like, let's go deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> you know, I think each of them, I knew that they had the capacity to go from something very superficial to then take it to the depths of the reader's heart. And I knew that it was going to be a responsibility and something that they would willfully and unknowingly be able to answer. (laughs) So it was never actually asked specifically, hey, let's like, let's like knock their socks off. I just knew that they would have the ability to do that. I'm so glad that it did that for you as well. (laughs) Oh, man. Now the book is written for women. I drew very much enjoyed the book, but what ways do you see the feminine heart I expressing living out the intellectual life differently than the man? Yeah. Sure. So, so Edith Stein, she actually wrote a little bit about this in her essays on women. And she said that women necessarily like with our twins. So we have Josephine and we have Benedict and When Josephine goes somewhere, she immediately just looks around at who's there that she can interact with and who gets her princess wave that day. And then Benedict immediately tries to find something so that he can figure out how that thing works. Like if we're like in a a restaurant, he's going to try to find this chair and see how does, why is this one soft and this one's hard? And, And so women just seem to be more oriented towards the person and men are more oriented towards function and to how things work. Um, and so I think that that, that has its play in the intellectual life that you'll see a lot of times when, when I give a talk somewhere, or even as these women are also giving their essays, there's a lot of experiential truths that are there. So they're able to take a truth and then draw it out and show it in, in their own lives. And then to also relate it to the reader and men, a lot of times operate in the other way. So there's, there's actually less experiential but there's more of an abstract vision that when when men share in, in these deep truths, um, not all the time, of course, for both, but that seems to be the, the majority. Um, the other thing that I was talking through with my husband the other day was I was telling telling him, I was like, you know, I, I think that when women 
just in, in the way that we bring life into the world physically, we take something outside of ourselves, bring it within ourselves to then build and foster life. Men must go outside of themselves to give of themselves. And then that brings life outside of themselves. That's the way just how physical life is conceived. And so I think it's the same way when, when you're exercising the gifts of grace and especially within the intellectual life, that that's why you see when he talks about in scripture, when they talk about Mary, she kept all of these things within her heart. And so just taking something within herself to then allow it to bring life. And then you see that the work of, of Christ's ministry was usually something outside of himself that he was bringing into the world to give life. And so mm -hmm. I think it's the same whenever we're exercising intellectual life that usually for us, for the feminine mind, it's usually going to be something that we're contemplating on for a while and that we're going to wake you up in the middle of the night and be like, hey, guess what? <laughs> um, or like in the middle of our thought and you're like, where did we? <laughs> I didn't have the first part of that conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> But that's that's really the way that I've seen it in our in our home and just with my friends as well. So, and you guys oh, are nodding. Drew. So is that happening in your? Oh, <laughs> Drew can definitely relate to that all the time. Um, can you catch me up of I, how we got here? What, what are we even? Where? What, what is going on right now? <laughs> I'll be like, oh, sorry. To explain my girl brain thought there, I let's take it back like three days and yeah. break down <laughs> the process of like what's yeah. been happening and where I'm at. And I'm, but here's the decision yeah. that I've like come to. And I'm like, are we still talking about dinner? We were, we were just talking about how we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. I guess we'll eat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 I, yes, I think that that's such a good point. And in, in one of the essays, it talks a lot about benediction and spirituality. Oh, yeah. Elizabeth Scalia is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, the gift to be able to contemplate in motherhood a lot or just in routine household tasks, and not that men don't do this, but physiologically our brains are structured a little bit different and right. a man lacks some of the fatty tissue that a woman's brain has. And so the interconnectedness and the reality that – he has this capacity to basically turn off his brain and mm -hmm. scientifically studying his heart rate will drop to like basically like his brain function, his heart, everything is at like right above dead. And like <laughs> he can reset in that manner that my brain and my body doesn't allow. So I think right. sometimes too, when we're doing contemplating work, when we're just washing the dishes where he's able to maybe go to what we call his nothing box. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And literally think about nothing. I am I'm washing the dishes, but I'm able to contemplate something else. And that sure. ability, I had a friend say, I'm constantly downloading. Like my brain mm -hmm. is like having to take in what I've read and download it and process it. And so even while I'm reading it, I may not get the full depth of what the Lord wants to reveal to me, but through the tasks of just – washing the dishes or washing the clothes or changing a diaper, I have the ability to process this. And not that a man cannot, because Drew definitely does that at times and enter into contemplation. But you referenced Mother Mary mm -hmm. and this idea that we like hold her up, but we need to hold up her intellect, her pondering in her heart, right. her ability to really take her study, take her knowledge in order to be able to give a full consent of her will uh, right. because with the intellect, our will is able to grow in holiness. And I just, I think that that's something that we negate sometimes, especially I want a child like faith that has confidence in the Lord, but there, there is this temptation, I think, to be not only childish, but just, I like faith has to just give a yes without any uh, understanding and there yeah. there's a part of that but I don't know if you can speak into how we also need some awareness in there yeah. as we flesh that out yeah I mean that's definitely one of the one of the first things that the Ignatian discernment of spirits tells you to do to, to be able to have some sort of awareness and then be able to take action well you can't have awareness or take action without the intellect but yeah. the other thing is is that there are going to be times when 
you need to intellectually discern to will the good mm. and then to take action for the good. So especially like if you're habitually, there's something that draws you into sin, something that draws you into temptation, or you just to take it to somewhere superficial, like you're, you want to sit down and study, but you know that you can't study if the baby's not napping, right? So why continue to try to do the thing that always causes frustration every day, right? But we do. And so sometimes we have to allow our intellect to inform our will to make better decisions and then to habitually make decisions that we don't actually feel like making so that we can then foster more virtue in our lives. Um, and so we really have to in- realize that that comes from that intellectual space. And it can't always be something that's driven by the emotion. You can you can be like a wind, that, like the hurricane that just came through Central Florida not too long ago. You can be the wind that destroys, or you can be the wind that's controlled and brings life, and mm-hmm. and allows allows the mountainside to be protected from, but then the valley to bring life in those places. So it has to be something that that is harnessed by your intellect, and we are, we we can't be people that are fragmented in that way. We have to be the fullness of who we are, and it requires us to think and think well. Mm, I think that was really well said. I want to ask a slightly off topic question, but I'm super <laughs> curious about it. And since we're here talking sure. to you anyways, so, uh, so <laughs> use this chance. Yeah. <laughs> I like to use these chances to talk to interesting people. Um, so your husband is a deacon. Uh, he is. Sir. Is he a deacon he, already? He's a deacon. He's a deacon okay. now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. How did you guys discern um, having six little kids <laughs> and your husband going into the act and it like our pew on Sunday mass looks like a WWE wrestling match. Um, and so <laughs> I am just so curious at what, yeah, just talk to me about that process. Sure. So in our diocese, we, it's a six year process. So it was one year of discernment and then uh, five years of formation. And so I remember I mean, so that was six years ago. We only had three kids at that point, uh, but they were all under, they were eight and under those three kids. And so it really came out of ministry. I remember we used to have young adults that would meet here once a week in this room. And one night we were sitting here, we had closed up our discussion and someone in the group turned to my husband and said, you'd be a great deacon. And, and then that night we were going to sleep. And he's like, do you really think I'd be a great deacon? And I was like, yes, I definitely think you would be a great deacon. And this also goes back to this whole, you know, JP2, he said in one of his documents, I think it was in Moliere's Dignitatum, but he said that the man doesn't even know he's a father until the wife tells him, like until his spouse tells him. Mm-hmm. And and that really came to, to play for us because Jason always tells people it was an idea, like, when someone said it to me, but it wasn't a possibility until you said it, until I said it to him. And so that night before we went to our first discernment meeting, I found out that we were pregnant with our fourth, with Abigail. <laughs> and I I tried to not tell him. I was like, he's not going to go. Like if I tell him we're about to have another kid, he's going to be like, well, we're not doing the diaconate thing. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> and so I tried to not tell him and I'm coming to bed and I, I he's like, what's wrong with your face? And I was like, I'm, my face is fine. <laughs> he's like, he's like, we're having another baby. And I was like, we are. <laughs> and so, and then to make it even funnier, we go to the next morning, the discernment thing, his heart's all heavy thinking about going into this. And the people that were already in formation were told to like, come and talk to us and like make us feel welcome in between the sessions. So <laughs> This couple comes up to us and they're they're chatting. They're going to die that I even am telling this in public. But they come up to us and they're like, oh, you know, it's so great. You guys are going to enjoy yourself. And then for some reason, Holy Spirit, the woman, the wife says, yeah, there was actually a lady not so long ago who had a baby like during this. I can't believe that someone would have a baby during formation. And she's like, oh, but it was fine. I mean, we all helped and it was great. And then. Then that was like the end of our conversation. (laughs) And so she walks away and Jason looks at me and he's like, what just happened? And I'm just like, let's just, let's just go about the day. And everything's fine. fine. (laughs) But we did, we did great. And then right before that last final year of diaconate formation, 
we found out we were pregnant with twins. <laughs> so, I mean, it was just a whole lot of crazy, crazy times. But I think that the other night someone asked me, when did you feel called? Like, how do you feel called to have six kids? And, mm -hmm. and I think that diaconate kind of falls into that too. Like, how did you feel called? And we do, my husband feels called. I mean, I, the way that this ontological reality has changed just for him, for our understanding mm -hmm. of, of his role as, as husband and as father, it's been almost tangible. But the other thing that's happened too, is that we've realized that even within our own life, that there's not, sometimes the call is not as clear, but what happens is that you don't run out of yeses. And so I always say, like, I didn't like feel called. I, if you would have said to 19 year old me, you're probably going to have six kids and a husband who's a deacon in the Catholic church. I would have like laughed in your face probably. <laughs> but now this, this yes, just, just flows from, from my yes to the Lord. And mm -hmm. And we haven't ran out of saying that yet. So <laughs> was there ever a moment in those conversations of, well, why don't we just wait 10 years? I feel mm. like culturally in the United States, which is different depending on what country you're in, that our deacons are just old. Like that's a retirement activity. Yeah. And so why don't we just wait for another 10 years until some of the kids are out of the house and we're retired? And so right. where was that in your discernment? Oh gosh, we had those conversations all the time. So <laughs> it was very present in our discernment. And so I think that for us, we would always pray with the fact that there are young families like us, like you guys, that if something is happening and you want to be able to talk about it, I think you want to talk to another young clergyman about that. You know, we talk about these, these, the, this springtime that's happening in the church and you're seeing in a lot of vocations to the priesthood, we're seeing it in vocations to religious life. And there's just such a joy there. And I think that that joy also resides in, in the heart of my husband. And I think that it resides in our family. And so mm -hmm. we knew that we were really answering a need, not only within our own hearts, because we really felt that call deeply, but also within our community and within the, the universality of the church that we are still young, that we are alive, and that we are here to to walk with you and to abide with you, even when you feel like, you know, no one's going through the same thing that we're going through right now. Actually, there's there's ordained clergy that are doing that and walking this with you. And that's been a really beautiful joy for us. Hmm. Amen. Oh, what a gift. What yeah. a gift to the Orlando Diocese, to the church at large. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your yeses, because I know that no matter the depth of his call, it's very hard to do that without the support of your yes as well I, and your ability to form your intellect, to build the good habits, to have the will to say yes to this. I, all I think circles in and without without healing that, without, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, just Sister Marion James chapter also or essay comes to mind as well because it's this reality that we may have to heal an area in order to be able to give a fuller yes. And so whether that's to the vocation of marriage, to children, to a job that changes our family dynamic, sometimes it's almost a step into the healing to allow our intellect. And I think that as you know, I said the first the first three essays challenged my uh, view of the intellectual life. Was you know you got to pray, you got to grow in virtue, and you <laughs> got to heal. And I was like, oh, that's like a different spin on read some books. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, we get to those chapters, we get to the reading books and writing and like all of that in the in the book. But oh, wait a minute. Ah, this is this is where we gotta start. Okay. Oh, let's pull it back. And I so I loved this obviously as I as I speak through this and have very much enjoyed, yeah, the truths that just spoke so deeply to my heart and to my intellect, uh, which should be united, uh, as so eloquently described within this within this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any any other quick thoughts yeah. before we go to the lightning round? No, I mean, thank you guys so much for your encouragement and encouraging people to read it because I think that I, my hope and my prayer is that it's handed on for, for more generations and creating deeper thinkers 
and really taking on the archetype of, of motherhood through our blessed mother in a way that that hasn't really been practiced except by the saints that we know and hopefully building up saints for the future. Amen. Amen. Speaking of saints, our first question on the lightning round is who is your favorite saint? Oh man, I know that this is the always the answer it feels like, but it is John Paul II. Yeah. That guy changed my life. So <laughs> yes. Oh. We we always allow that answer. Always. Thank you. Always. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm not gonna lie, Drew tried to, he was like, I need to like skim, like I need I need to finish the book. And last night I was like, did you finish it? And he goes, no, there was an essay about John Paul II and it totally captivated me. Oh and I'm man, still worse. <laughs> so, he has finished. I did finish but he did finish oh, yes. the book, but there was like this, I can skip. No, I can't. I can't. I tried You were that. exercising it's so your good. <laughs> It is so good. And so, yes. Oh, it's yes. great. <laughs> John Paul II, he'll always tell you. Just he will. Out. He'll always yeah. derail and you too. So yeah. good. Yeah. In. Just allow yourself to sit with this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, next question on the lightning round, since I slowed it down, is your favorite devotion? Oh man, favorite devotion. So, I love the rosary. I love bringing all of my complaints to the Blessed Mother because, of course, with a family of six and all my chaos, that is the devotion that always brings me peace. Because every Hail Mary, I'm like, should have gotten up earlier. Hail Mary. Full of grace. <laughs> and then the next beat, I'm like, should have laid out their clothes a little bit sooner. Hail Mary. <laughs> and so until the end when she so lovingly always takes all of the things that I'm so worried about. And she's like, all right, let it go, Rachel. <laughs> We're going to keep going into all of these these mysteries and dive deeper into, into salvation. So um, that's been a beautiful thing. And then of course the liturgy of the hours, which is not necessarily devotion, but the, the official prayer of the church is something that we really enjoy doing as a family and really has beginning and end of our day. Mm, that's really beautiful. Uh, speaking of the intellectual life, what is your favorite book recommendation? This is a really hard question for a lightning round. Very rude. I'm just going to let you guys know. I've enjoyed this time up until this question. <laughs> <At> this <point. laughs> <laughs> now, oh, I'm gonna fit ten into the <laughs> Yeah, right. So I mean, you can have you can have at least three. Get okay, three. thank you, thank you. Yeah. So I would say <laughs> the three books. If I had to pick three quickly that changed my life, would be Life of the Beloved by Henry Nouwen, Love and Responsibility by Carol Wotia, and The Discernment of Spirits from Father Timothy Gallagher. All three are on my bookshelf. I like those are so good. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and where can people find out more about what you have going on, this book, your future book, all of it? They can go to rachelbullman.com. And I try to make all of the handles easy. So I'm usually on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And it's just Rachel Bullman on all three platforms. Perfect. Awesome. Well, Rachel, oh man, this has been so much fun. Thank you for coming on the show. Um, for our listeners, again, um, with all her mind, we'll leave a link in the description um, for you guys to check that out. Please go read this um, and don't skim it because you can't. It's yeah. impossible. It's too good. <laughs> thank you. Uh, for all of our listeners, um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we're praying for you all until next time. God bless.